Following on from the previous ILO and Polanyi's observation that a focus on equity suggests that economic planning needs to have social inclusion as an important benchmark, we now turn our attention to the social within the green economy, specifically to the Sustainable Development Goals and the case for the increased role of the social system as guided by the dominant pillars of sustainability, the economy and the environment. We need to contribute to a vision of society where economic, environmental and social goals are not in conflict. We can't continue along the current path without addressing the social. The, the, the social pillar is fundamentally missing in the discussions so far, but the, and the clock is ticking. Social policy is central to achieving sustainable development, but it often takes a back seat to economic and environmental policy. Policy coherence without addressing the social aspects, the distributional aspects, uh, uh, the cultural aspects, uh, the green economy will never uh, fulfill its, its potential. Policies should be mutually supportive of environmental, social and economic dimensions in order to address structural problems. But once scaled up, a uh, green growth strategy actually resembles a major um, and complex policy reform, not dissimilar to what we saw during the structural adjustment era when we were asking countries to reform their economies. Green economy will require a, a great deal of investment and public investment, but we have to be quite aware of not making of this um, an implication of cutting social spending, which has increased in Latin America. Uh, and we have the terrible experience of the structural adjustment programs during the 1980s and 1990s and the impacts were quite terrible and we're still paying for that in terms of human capital. There's a need for transformative social policies that go beyond protection and compensation of vulnerable groups to address the underlying causes of poverty and inequality, especially for the poor. It's also about redistribution, human capital formation, aspects to do with care and social reproduction. If crises end up in Africa, it's not because it's a place in a map, it's because of the way in which Africa is integrated uh, at a regional level, a continental level, and into the wider world market and world political system. Following a green growth agenda involves substantial structural changes that often are not just politically challenging, but can have negative short-term uh, impacts on the poor considerations that we must bear in mind when thinking of what will the uh, impacts of a green economy cause to livelihoods and households, particularly the poorest and the most vulnerable ones. Effective policies must also be based on local realities and grassroots knowledge. Well, the farmers who were used to using the forests and the water uh, water bodies in, in a very, very sustainable ways. They're being now prevented from using these resources in the name that the bureaucrats or the techno-bureaucrats know better about managing environment than those who have been living there for hundreds of years and have devised a way to coexist without harming uh, the environment. bring knowledge on local values and practices much more into global thinking um, on green economy and sustainable development issues. If national governments do not decentralize their powers to local governments, to civil society organizations, uh, local people we, would, would never be heard. To achieve coherent policy implementation, various obstacles have to be overcome. It is not that the government is not doing anything has come up with uh, various welfare programs, but these have not uh, yielded the desired results, all because there is a corruption, there is uh, a lot of politics in um, implementing these um, programs. Also, uh, the resources have been overstretched. Policy making in India in the last 10 to 15 years 
there is not much debate about what needs to be done. In fact, in the mainstream sort of, you know, uh, dis discourse on policy making, there's a consensus that everyone knows what needs to be done. The discussion really is about how that needs to be done. India's problem is not having good legislation on the books. It's getting it implemented in a way that makes for practical outcomes. China has, you know, the opposite problem. You know, it's it's capable of implement, implementing pretty much anything it turns its mind to, um, but it does not have these sort of progressive policies in place. Green jobs is one example of a policy strategy that brings together social, economic and environmental aspects of production. But the social effects must also be carefully measured and monitored. Um, the estimate of roughly 60,000 jobs have been created within this renewable off-grid sector in, in, in Bangladesh. While it is true that it is quite likely that new employments will be generated and are being already generated in green sectors and green jobs as part of a green jobs agenda, uh, there is also the risk that some cuts in jobs and wages will occur particularly because of cutting uh, unsustainable activities from the pers environmental perspective. What we don't know as yet is um, what are the effects of the renewable industry sector um, on job creation on entrepreneurship and other social aspects in the um, renewable energy sectors. What's clearly needed is a substantial echo, what I call echo social investment. Another key challenge for a fair and green economy is to change consumption patterns in developed countries through proactive social policies. If those in the north want to preserve what they have, it's minus growth for the south or being paid off, bought off, in order not to impinge on the, the growth dynamic, the status quo in the, in the north. How do you apply the green economy context in the context of a developed country, when the primary problem perhaps is not so much poverty eradication, but actually the reduction of consumption? Is that if you go to see somebody and say, I know you're very happy with your lifestyle, you love the way you drive to work, you love the industry that you're in, uh, you love your lifestyle, you love your holidays, we, all of those things are devastating to the lives of people in poor countries. The rational human response to that per for that person is to call you a liar. I think this would clearly mean an attack on the liberalisation and deregulation agenda of the last 25 years and would mean a reversal of that. So these sorts of policies um, would also imply a more interventionist uh, state role. How do we transform the system? There's probably a widespread sense that global environmental change will require a major transformation. Fundamental changes in structures of production and consumption, in patterns of resource use and investments, in technologies and how we use them and in human behaviour and the public policies from local to global levels. All this, I think, requires major upfront public expenditure on infrastructure investment and subsidies uh, in order to enable lower income households to get, get this stuff done without suffering big reductions in income. And regulation and green taxation, and so and, and national planning. What emerges, I think, clearly is the need for what we might call joined-up analysis, joined-up policy, and joined-up action. The need for public participation, wide, you know, broad-based stakeholder cons consultation, engagement of the private sector, public-private partnerships. Even if we get agreement on a coordinated policy approach, there are issues about how you can translate these new policies into something that is lasting by translating it in new forms of governance and institutionalized compromise. I think but paradoxically this does lead us back then to the redistribution of income and wealth. The uh, extraordinary and e egregious inequalities in income and wealth which we've seen arising in the last 25 years have to be reversed for a whole range of, of, of reasons. In addition to the national and global imperatives for social inclusion, there are a number of emerging social business models. 
Social enterprises are those enterprises towards the middle of this diagram are hybrid organizations that trade goods and services to achieve social, environmental, economic, and cultural outcomes. A common way to describe them is to use a spectrum with traditional charities on the one end and traditional businesses at the other, with varieties of social enterprise occupying the space in between. This diagram, adapted from the social enterprise spectrum, illustrates is illustrated to help think about the varied business models employed by social enterprises. Have a look yourself and see if you can think of a charity, organization, or company that fits in each. Think of anything from Tom's Shoes, the Thank You Products, Red Cross, to the Body Shop. Social Enterprise provides a unique alternative to traditional social service provision. Traditionally, social, environmental, economic, and cultural initiatives are developed and implemented by government or the public sector and delivered in partnership with either business or charities. Government agencies now have another option and are increasingly partnering with social enterprises to develop innovative new approaches to solving tough problems. Social enterprise combines, combines public benefit with commercial acumen and is sometimes described as the fourth sector because their approach combines aspects of all three traditional ways of operating.